Hello, my name is Dr. John Kent. I'm a specialist in family medicine and for the past 30 years I've worked uh, with Dr. Chan Gunn uh, in Canada and now I work in Israel. And we'll go through the idea of the pathophysiology of myofascial pain according to Dr. Gunn's model. Um, does this make a difference in the way that we treat with dry needling? Not really but it does give us a very good uh, place to find a handle on the, the, the why of our problem, which perhaps isn't just related to the local muscle, uh, but more regionally. And it will give an explanation of the autonomic findings that we sometimes see uh, when we are examining our patient carefully in a focused physical examination. And of course, it'll change our considerations for treatment and affect influence or perhaps shorten the number of treatments necessary in coming, at a, coming to a satisfactory outcome. We've seen in the previous lectures that muscle pathology um, may be caused by local microtrauma or perhaps a local energy crisis. That's the prevailing theory with Travell and Simons and those that have followed them uh, or stood on their shoulders because they've provided a very, very good basis. But what we have found um, along with them is that inflammation is not likely a cause for myofascial problems and we don't have to look for redness and swelling in order to determine a problem uh, or a cause of the patient's pain. Uh, similarly, we can rule out ongoing nociception as a reason for the patient's musculoskeletal problem. They don't have a pin sticking in there. And so that's not a cause. Well, what otherwise could be Dr. Gunn introduces the idea of a neuromuscular unit, which we know from our basic physiology uh, is an intact, active unit. Uh, we can't uh, function without a nerve attached to a muscle and its reflex arc to, back to the central nervous system. If we go back to our origins, fetus, we can see very early on developing a spinal cord and a segmental distribution to the body. Well, this is a pattern that works. A fossil from a trilobite from three billion years ago shows exactly the same pattern of growth. This is how the body is built. It's a segmental fashion. Let's use that, build on it, and help to find our patient's problem. If we look at our architecture from the standpoint of the entire spine, for every nerve that comes out from between two vertebrae, the first thing that happens, the anterior and posterior units uh, combine and we have a dorsal root ganglion where the nucleus of the nerve is for all of the, uh, the uh, sensory nerves. And then immediately after that, as the nerve exits the neural foramen, we have the nerve splitting into an anterior primary ramus, which feeds the, uh, the, the segment, or uh, as well as a posterior primary ramus. And that ramus, the medial branch, feeds the multifidi muscles, which are attached from one vertebra to the next, or up and down uh, two or three segments. Uh, and the multifidi function as dynamic ligaments. They are activated by the body, and not under conscious control, prior to movement and they stabilize the spine uh, to respond to the load of the muscles innervated by the lateral branch of the posterior primary ramus, the erector spinae muscles, the other muscles that are involved in the actual movement of the spine. In addition, for the thoracic segments, but up and down from there as well, we have a sympathetic chain. We have an autonomic nervous system working at each segment of the body and this is the, we'll find the autonomic influence of segmental problems seen in the periphery as we do our focused physical examination. When we look at one of these nerves, say a motor nerve coming out from the spinal cord, the dorsal root ganglion itself is often in humans 3 to 18 microns in its length. The axon from there going down to an effector organ, such as the muscles of the toes, that axon may be a meter and a half long. 
if we think of that in terms of uh, uh, proportions, if the dorsal root ganglion was the height of me, almost 1.8 meters, well, getting to the big toe would be the equivalent of me standing in Los Angeles calling on San Bernardino, London to Dover, uh, Amster uh, sorry, Brussels to The Hague, and Tel Aviv to Akko. It's a long way. If we're looking at electrical excitation, that happens almost inst instantaneously, 20 meters a second. But the axoplasmic flow, which also maintains us a healthy nerve, will take far longer. We have to go from our, our, the, the brain of the nerve in that dorsal root ganglion is the nucleus. That's where we get the information which is going to formulate all those neurotransmitters and modulators and keep that nerve healthy. And a problem with the function of the nucleus will influence the axoplasmic flow and make the nerve sicker. Walter Cannon uh, in the 1940s developed an idea of disuse sensitivity. Uh, we know his name. He's one of the fathers of physiology. He was the first to recognize the fight or flight syndrome, autonomic symptoms. In his studies about denervation supersensitivity, he realized that in a neuromuscular unit, a motor unit, we must have a healthy nerve uh, uh, influencing a muscle to keep it healthy. And the idea of that neuromuscular unit is that the nerve supplies a trophic effect, a healthy growth effect. And when we, in, when we interrupt or block motor impulses on that nerve at any point in the nerve and deprive the effector organ, the muscle, of its input, we're going to have a problem. The muscle is going to develop a disuse hypersensitivity and we'll also see from a segmental uh, viewpoint epiphenomena. How does that work? Well, if we have a radio station in a city providing a radio signal, we don't need a very sophisticated instrument to be able to listen to the music on the radio. However, if we go out to the periphery, somewhere out in the desert, and the signal is far weaker, we need to have a method to increase the sensitivity of our radio and be able to pick up that signal. Well, this is exactly what the muscle does when it's deprived of its excitatory input, its trophic input, by the nerve. Um, in my first year medical school, we did a physiology lab. One of the things we did was pith a frog, cut its sciatic nerve, and then measure the sensitivity, sensitivity of the gastrocnemius to acetylcholine uh, stimulation. And in a certain bath of acetylcholine, it would get a muscle contraction. After a week, we needed far less acetylcholine to stimulate the muscle. And this is what Lomo did in the 70s. He did a very elegant uh, uh, research which showed if after uh, denervating a muscle at five days, we're left with a muscle which is super sensitive. It is 1,000 times more sensitive to acetylcholine. It has increased its acetylcholine receptors over the entire muscle. Loma went further. He started stimulating the nerve, first at 14-hour intervals, and found a decrease in that supersensitivity. He started in, uh, exciting the muscle at three-hour intervals, electrical stimulation of the muscle, and found that that sensitivity decreased to normal levels after a month or two. If he cut the sciatic nerve left it for five days, and then started exciting the muscle continuously, quite quickly, the muscle returned to its normal sensitivity. It required the same amount of acetylcholine to cause a muscle contraction as a healthy muscle, which was innervated. So it just shows we all need a little bit of charge in our life, particularly minus 70 millivolts to keep every cell alive. But we also need a trophic effect to keep that happening. A normal muscle, will have its acetylcholine receptors immediately under the motor end plate. We see also the receptors where the Golgi tendon apparatus comes in at the musculotendinous junction. And that's a healthy nerve. We have the motor point, we have acetylcholine at the motor end plate, and that's going to function well. If we have a sick segment, 
if we have a problem with the dorsal root ganglion or the, or the nerve going to the muscle, we're going to see problems of thickened skin and thickened subcutaneous tissue, which we'll call trophedema, trophic edema. And we'll talk more about that in a future lecture. But that's one of the physical findings. In the muscle itself, it's become supersensitive. How? The acetylcholine receptors under the motor endpoint have expanded to involve the entire muscle, and any acetylcholine around is going to cause a muscle tightening. It's not under voluntary control. It doesn't require the, the nerve acting on it. It's simply sitting there in a regular acetylcholine bath, and the muscle will cause, it'll cause a tightening of the muscle itself. And so we're seeing a disturbance of nerve function, which will then cause the muscle problem. If we have a local energy crisis, such as Travell and Simons uh, postulate, this may be some of the, the predisposing causes of that problem. The most vulnerable part of any nerve is its dorsal root ganglion, where the nucleus is. And that's where we often have the most problems of degenerative findings, even as we grow up. We start degenerating even before we've got our driver's license. This happens in our teens and continues. And the degeneration continues to a greater or lesser extent in all of us. So if we think of spondylosis as a primary um, contributing factor, uh, we will then find that it may have an influence on the function of the dorsal root ganglion and therefore cause an axonal dysfunction, not necessarily to the electrical impulses, but to the axoplasmic flow, the, the nerve's cytoskeleton internally, and the transmission of impulses to the end of the nerve as it works on uh, a motor end plate. Well, that's going to cause a problem with a segmental effect and therefore a muscle supersensitivity. The supersensitive muscle will be tighter and cause a contraction. If we think not only about the muscles involved with that anterior primary ramus to the periphery, but we also think of the paravertebral multifidi going through the same problem because they, the posterior ramus arises after the dorsal root ganglion, we're going to start having a problem of a vicious circle. And that in order to reverse the problems of that myofascial pain in the periphery, we'll have to look at the paravertebral muscles and perhaps treat them as well in our treatment program. And this is how the segmental pathology uh, Gunn's model of the cause of myofascial pain will cause a reason for segmental treatment, not only at um, the area. So that's our basis for Gunn's model. The sympathetic chain is going to give us more signs in the periphery of a segmental problem, and that is essential in Gunn's model of diagnosis. We've gone through for any spinal segment, the idea that the problem will present with a, uh, a difficulty often from muscles innervated by the anterior primary ramus. But we find autonomic changes on our physical examination and as part of our treatment, we'll treat muscles of the posterior primary ramus as well. The signs of a radiculopathy will be the signs of our physical examination, which we already know to do. We're very uh, we're experienced in that. And as we go through, we will find problems at a segmental level. However, as we palpate, as we observe, we'll also see autonomal segmental signs. And we'll go through these signs in a future lecture as evidence of a segmental problem. The special tests that we do to confirm our diagnosis on physical examination, a lot of the basis for our courses and we strongly uh, uh, would love to see you come to uh, our practical courses to put all of this into action. And of course, if we needle a muscle and get a response to treatment, our, our, our diagnosis, diagnostic treatment can be very gratifying and lead to a uh, response with, uh, in front of our eyes. 
What is the treatment if we choose to do deep dry needling, intramuscular stimulation, or even uh, myofascial uh, release, muscle releases? The needle treatment will cause an effect like an artificial nerve. Put the needle in, it stimulates the muscle. If we're near the motor end point, we'll cause a twitch, and then we'll cause a reflex relaxation. And that is wonderful. The patient feels a twitch and says, what's that? And I tell them, your muscle jumped for joy at being stimulated. And after it's stimulated, it relaxes. The tissues are softer. The patient feels something has been relieved. That's a wonderful feeling. Gunn, in his model of treatment, suggests also looking at and even treating the muscles of the posterior primary ramus, the paravertebral muscles, as a way to augment our treatment and, and stop that vicious circle. So when we treat a patient, we will expect after the treatment, if we've arrived at a correct diagnosis, to see a relaxing of the muscle that'll immediately cause an increase in range of motion, a change in the tissue texture as the muscle becomes less tight and certainly a change in pain level. Uh, I don't take anything less than three out of 10 on a visual analog scale as a sign of the patient actually having a response. And often I'll have a 50% or even a 90% response to treatment after one needle or one needling. After a treatment, a patient may have relief. He may have soreness, post-needling soreness which lasts for several, two to two to several days. Um, and they may even have a change in their pain pattern if I've treated one muscle out of a segment and not other muscles involved in the problem. So I'd like to think that we've gone from the evidence-based medicine m uh, model, which is uh, uh, basically put forward by the drug companies who do their research and therefore cause our our, our research-based to be more evidence-biased medicine because they're in the business of selling their drugs. So, of course, they want to heavily subsidize a huge amount of research to maintain their profits. What we have at our disposal is our experience. And in the office, in the clinic, we're going to change this evidence medicine into medicine-based evidence. And the examination of the patient and treatment will give us that. Thank you.